Welcome to the Round 6 Podcast, a weekly roundtable discussion featuring a variety of automotive subjects, interviews, special guests, and stories, hosted by the Round 6 Gearheads, Brian Stupski, Brad King, Alex Welsh, and Eric Hibbs. Joining the Gearheads for a very special episode 20 is hot rod designer, builder, and all-around nice guy, Chip Foose. <laughs> How it works. All right. Well, hey, uh, that all said, um, welcome to the Round 6 Podcast. I'm Brian. I'm Brad. I'm Alex. I'm Eric. And, uh, you know, uh, tonight, in lieu of doing our usual podcast, uh, I've decided that I would like to read to you all a, a selection from my redacted overhaul and fan fiction. Uh, it, it's, it's erotica-based, and I refer to this one as Eat a Bag of Chips. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm not even going to bother. And I'm not going to bother. Oh, shit. Oh, shit. But with us tonight is Mr. Chip Foose. Hello, Chip. Thank you for the introduction like that. <laughs> it's a pleasure to be here. <laughs> oh, my gosh. So how the heck are you, sir? I'm fantastic. Awesome. Went out and picked up a Jaguar from Luke DeLay, who is uh, Marcel's son. We, uh, we're doing this E-type, and he's metal shaped, and he did those pieces for us, and we just brought it back so I can get back to work on that here in the shop. Outstanding, man. I mean, you are probably the busiest human being on the planet, so it, it goes without saying, you know, if we even ask you to make a list of the things you're working on, well, that could probably fill the whole episode. So why don't we start there? <laughs> Well, I'm not as busy as I used to be when we were filming. It's uh, a lot easier, and I spend a lot more time with my family, which is nice. Excellent. So speaking of family, I mean, some people are born with a genetic predisposition to become like a, a doctor or a lawyer. You know, they just become a natural in their field. For you, you seem to have been born with some kind of a genetic marker for hot rod, which... Thinking back on that now sounds kind of like something you might ask Ron Jeremy. Um, <laughs> I, I guess. The, the, <laughs> uh, speaking the, of hot rods, <laughs> the question here might be: How did how did you know you were going to be into cars? Was was this was this a thing from birth, or did you kind of just you know come into I, it through the I family? Was... You know, I don't really remember being introduced to cars. I was kind of born into this with my, my father. I don't remember being introduced to the automotive industry. It's more like I was born into it. I, I feel that my my career is an extension of my father's. Uh, at the age of three years old, my father was running uh, Gene Winfield's shop in Arizona called AMT, and which was uh, American Model Toys. But they ran a full-size shop where they built the real cars, and then those got tailored into the model kits. And I would go to the shop with my dad on the on the weekends at – three years old and I could watch him building these cars and, and also the crew because they worked Saturdays and Sundays too sometimes. But uh, I would go down there and then, you know, a few months later, the cars that he was finishing were coming out in plastic model kits. So I was able to build those at home and also metallic hot wheels of the cars that they were building as well. So as a little kid, I got to watch my dad build a car. I got to duplicate that in a scale model kit at home or carry around a Hot Wheel in my pocket. And awesome. my career today is the same thing as the cars that we Revell as a model kit and uh, we build building the die cast. And it's amazing, but uh, you know, I'm still living the dream. Like I say, my career, I feel, is an extension of my father's. And it was amazing at the age of three, going to the shop with him and watching him build these cars. And I remember the a la carte had come in which, of course, was built by uh, Best. But then they tore it all apart and measured everything and scaled it down and created the model kit. And then my, my dad repainted the Then it was for sale. My dad 
flipped actually twenty five hundred dollars. Didn't tell my mom right away, but then when she found out, she flipped out, and he had to sell it back to uh, AMT, and then it was sold again. But you know that car for for two weeks, my dad owned it, which was amazing. And I know that when Roy Brizio restored it for John Mumford, the paint job that was on it at that time was my dad's paint job, which had all the way from uh, I think that was 1968. He had redone it. 68 wow. or 69 is cool. when they redid it's it for a long time. time when my dad owned it. But I was, it was an amazing childhood. And then when my dad had his own shop up in Santa Barbara, which is where I was born and raised, I started going to this shop with him when I was seven years old. I'd like to say that I was helping him, but I know I destroyed a lot more than I actually helped in the beginning. But my dad, you know, was an amazing teacher and he's my hero to this day. But he also had another designer that was coming in who had retired in uh, Ventura, California, just south of Santa Barbara. And that was Alex Trembulus. He was a big fan of my father's and he would come around. He would bring scale models and my dad or I started painting them later, but my dad was painting his models when I was just a kid. But when Alex came in and he brought his artwork, now Alex had worked for Auburn Duesenberg back in the 30s. He designed the Tucker. He was the head of the Thunderbird studio through the 60s for Ford Motor Company. He retired in uh, Ventura and he would hang out at my dad's shop. He would do drawings of the cars that my dad was doing and he would bring in these amazing sketches and when I saw his stuff, I thought, that's what I want to do. And he told me about Art Center College of Design, which is where I actually went. And uh, I have a degree in industrial design, you know, specializing in automotive. But uh, that's all because of my father and Alex is uh, where I got my start and how I was introduced to this. Wow. What a mentor. <laughs> Too cool. Wow. <laughs> Pretty amazing. Great memories. That's fantastic. Thank you. Yeah, made him clean up and, and put his little toys away. It was out in the street I when I was getting everything I can't set tell up. you how many wet paint jobs I stuck my finger in when I was a kid. <laughs> wow, that looks amazing. I'd touch it, you know, because he originally didn't have a spray booth. He was painting things and then just walking into the other room. Right. I'd come in. You know, mom might drop me off. I'd walk into the shop and I'd go, wow, that's cool. Oops. Okay. <laughs> and, and the rule was if I messed something up to tell my dad about it right away because – he didn't want to find it when it was too late. Now the customer's coming to pick it up. I did something. Or, or I, did something. I remember he was doing a uh, Lamborghini Miura. He had painted He had just done it candy root beer brown. This is in 1975 or 76. Candy root beer brown. We were color sanding and rubbing it. It was all polished. Now we are reassembling it. And my father gave me a gallon can full of lacquer thinner with a rag and he gave me all the door rubbers and the and the the rear latch all the rubbers to wipe those clean with the with the lacquer thinner before they would glue them back in and then my mom showed up and she says you got to go to the dentist we got to go so i left we go to the dentist and i get back and my dad's in the office and he said what'd you do with that wet lacquer thinner rag before you left for the dentist oh no oh uh -oh. i have no idea well, he walked me back there, and I had just laid it right on the hood of the car. And now that wet lacquer thinner, PNT 90, had melted into the candy root beer brown paint job that was already color sand and rubbed. And, yeah, then I had, to, I had to pull it out, feather it out, and block it, and my dad went over it. But, yeah, when I was nine was my first paint lesson. I remember my, my dad told me to go out to the back of the shop, which is where we used to throw all the uh, destroyed panels, and I grabbed a Volkswagen hood and brought it into the shop. And he said, okay, go ahead and straighten that out. So I hammered and dollied it and bondoed it and blocked it, got it in primer, and I ended up painting it pearl white. And he said, now do some graphics on it. So I did some flames and I did a couple stripes and uh, cleared it. And then I color sanded and rubbed it and got it all done. And he said, now when you get it all done, come and find me. Now, I'm sure it was probably awful, but in my mind, what I remember, it was this beautiful, perfect Volkswagen hood that – could have gone on any show Volkswagen if you finished the rest of it this way. <laughs> and I walked to the other room and I grabbed my dad where he was hammer and dolling on a fender of a car. And I said, I got the hood all finished. Come look at it. So he walks over there and he's looking at the hood. He says, well, you did a nice job. And he still had the hammer and dolly in his hand. And he hauls back and he hits right in the middle of that hood, right in the graphics and everything with the hammer. He says, now fix that. And I remember <laughs> I, I hammered and dollied it. I bonded it. I fixed it. And then I taped off a square I had primered it and I ticked off a square and I painted it white and I unmasked it and there's a big white square. <laughs> and that's when he taught me how to blend everything and how to spot paint jobs. So yeah, I've been painting since I was nine. Wow. wow. That's too painted yeah, I, 
at nine years old, if my dad did that, we would have gone the rounds. And I, <laughs> I would have got my butt kicked, but, you know, <laughs> I wouldn't have let that slide. I would have let him know who was boss. It, it was a good lesson. It's better to do it on that than to do it on a car in the shop or the uh, Lamborghini with a lacquer thinner rag in it. <laughs> I, thought, I thought you were going to tell me you was going to throw some lacquer thinner on a rag and st stick it on the hood and say, come on, son, let's go to lunch. That was actually before I did that to the oh. Lamborghini. I think <laughs> I was right or I was, when I did the lacquer thinner on the, that was about 12. So three years later, I did that. Oh, wow. Not a good thing. Well, that, which, that it makes sense. That's why he had you feather it out and fix it. That, yes. At that point. Okay. <laughs> also, the same year is when my dad taught me how to drive. I used to ride around with him. The 56 pickup that I have now that was overhauled for me, the black one, uh -huh. when my dad drove that, that was his daily driver. And I used to ride next to him and I would air shift because it was all stock. I had the three on the tree and I would ride next to my dad and I would pretend that I was pushing in the clutch and I was shifting the truck and letting the clutch out and hitting the throttle again. So at the age of 12 years old, it was a Friday afternoon that uh, my dad was gonna teach me how to drive. Now, I had been working all that week on a Rolls Royce that had come in because the Rolls had a couple door dings on the sides. So the Rolls had come in and we had fixed those door dings and painted both sides of the car. It was being color sand and rubbed when I grabbed a primer gun out of the mixing room and I'm walking behind the Rolls and I hadn't fixed the cup of the primer gun properly to the gun and the cup fell and hit the ground and lacquer primer went all over the back of the Rolls Royce. I tried to wipe it off, but it etched the paint. We ended up having to paint the back of the car as well, sides and the back, and we had it backed in in front of the uh, office. It was ready for the customer to come pick it up. And my dad says, uh, let's go for a driving lesson. So at 12 years old, I get in the truck, which is parked right next to the Rolls, and I back the truck out, and we drive all around the airport property. And my dad said I did absolutely perfect, never missed a shift never chattered the clutch. I did everything properly and we're coming back in to the shop and he told me to park next to the rolls. Now this is where it was difficult because at 12 years old, this is an all stock truck, no power steering, no power brakes, but I've got, I've got my foot on the brake and I'm using my body weight to turn the truck and it's difficult <laughs> to turn. So I'm pulling with all my weight while I've got my foot on the brake trying to turn the wheels and my foot slips off the brake and I nail the throttle, light up the rear tires, and I ran right in front of that Rolls. Oh, that, was, that was another one. So, I mean, it goes on and on. I can tell you some of these stories. <laughs> and, uh, you know, my dad just looked at me and says, well, you got three of them. Because when I hit the Rolls, I pushed the Rolls into a Porsche that was parked next to that. <laughs> and then we proceeded to immediately that night go look for parts for the truck because the truck was supposed to be at the uh, F-100 Nationals the following Friday. So then my dad and I ended up working all week and we rebuilt the whole front of that truck, got it painted and finished so that he could take it up to the nationals that weekend. Wow. So, yeah. so let this be a, listen, a lesson to the kids. If you want to be like Chip, start destroying your dad's crap real early. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Hopefully uh, your father's will be as uh, understanding as mine. Yeah, I, I, I wouldn't. <laughs> my kids will be the first one to tell you that. <laughs> so as a nine-year-old and knowing how to paint were you like the neighborhood bike customizer kid that everybody wanted you to spray their bikes well when i was 12 years old i actually had a bike shop on the side of my parents house and i would go to swap meets and garage sales and buy bikes i would strip them down and hang all the parts on the on the fence i would throw the frame and forks and, and the chain guard in the back of my dad's truck he would drive it to work i would go to school after school, I would ride my bike to work, and then I would paint that frame after five because I'd work on customers' cars till five. And then my dad was always working late, so I would work late. I would paint these bikes, bring them back, and uh, reassemble the bikes. So I had finished bikes at the end of the uh, side yard. And when somebody wanted to come in and buy a bike, they'd walk in and see those or other parts, and I would put these bikes together. And one weekend, my dad comes to the side, side yard, and I had broken the fence in a couple places, putting nails in the fence so I could hang all the parts. He said, okay, that's it. No more bike shop. So I had a big sale and sold all the parts and all the bikes and uh, got rid of the bike shop. But, yeah, I've always been into bikes as well. Were you into certain bikes, certain types of bikes back then? Like it was kids, man, having a Schwinn, that was like the best of the bikes, you know, for a regular kid. Yeah, the kid. Schwinns is what everybody wanted. 
Yeah. And, uh, but see, those were still brand new, so I couldn't find those. So it was a lot of huffies and other stuff that uh, I was okay. getting cheap and trying to build. You know, I'd put cool paint jobs on them, so they'd want them because it was, you know, fun paint stuff. Or I would end up welding up the tank up front and do graphics on that and then sell them. Okay, I, what is the bike that's in the that's in the showroom by the by the desk up front there? It's on the far corner back there. Uh, that's a 1936 Elgin Bluebird. I've never seen one before. Yeah, oh, those, wow. that's that's a pretty rare bike. A, okay, we got door noises here. We got, a, we got a door going down in the shop. We can wait. That's awesome. It's just like being there. <laughs> so, <laughs> I can so smell the bondo dust. <laughs> the Elgin Bluebird's kind of all Art Deco, is it not? Yes, it yes. is. Yeah, Absolutely. extremely Art Deco. So I, I still so have I, bikes around here. I suspect it has a uh, cool bitch and foos design paint job on it. No, that- it's it's all restored. It's original paint, original color. I'm not original paint, but same original colors, but all redone and restored. Nice. That's cool. I, uh, I wonder, though. If there's a group of people out there now, especially knowing that you were out there building bikes as a kid, I just wonder if there's a group of people now who are like searching all over the place looking for bikes that you customized as a kid. <laughs> uh, I would think those are all completely destroyed by now. How awesome would that be, though? Find one of these. I know I'm going to put one on Craigslist and be like, original Chip <laughs> Foose design bicycle. Dude, this is going to be awesome. I just beat you to it. I just put a rainbow bright bike up on Craigslist. <laughs> 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 I did that one. <laughs> the original, the original Rainbow Bright bike. <laughs> Remember the Yamaha uh, motocross yes. bikes? Yeah, yeah. some of those. I, I'd find those and I'd redo them, and clean them up, give all the all the parts to the chrome shop. They'd redo all the chrome and I'd get it all back together and assemble it and sell them. Yep. I oh, probably was awesome. losing money, but I was having fun. Those were cool bikes. A friend of mine had one of those. He also had a bike called a Graco, which had a full suspension on it, even back in the day. The thing was a tank, but it was a really cool bike. Yeah. Yeah, those things weighed like 45 pounds, didn't they? They were heavy. (laughs) Yeah, you could go up any jump, you know, but... Yeah, Yeah, wouldn't get much air. They landed so softly. Yeah. The bike got to the ground before you did because it <laughs> yeah, was so Yeah, heavy. you were the first one to the accident scene. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So there's, we so, should do a comparison between what you were doing out west with your bikes and then somewhere back east there's a guy who was like covering the seats with like alligator skin. <laughs> there we go. Yeah. So Chip, do you still uh, are you still an avid bike collector or? Oh, yeah. Yeah. Um, I've. Right now, I'd say I probably have close to 35, 40 bikes. How cool. Yeah. Got some old stuff. Uh, got an 1884 Columbia high wheel, Columbia. Oh, wow. And do you, do you know why they were designed that way with a big wheel up front and a little wheel in the back? It was run over the cow turds without falling down, wasn't it? That's before they invented the chain. <laughs> so the bigger like they can make that. better. Yeah. <laughs> the bigger they could get that front wheel, the faster they could go. So that's that's where that design came from. The next well, year, I also – so that was 1884. I also have an 1885 Columbia Pope. It's a chainless bike, and uh, it's regular-sized wheels that we're familiar with, but they're 28-inch. But it was a shaft drive bike through the rear tube. And then I have, a, uh, I have an 1887 two-speed shaft drive bike. And a bunch of other stuff, but a lot of also the uh, balloon tire bikes, I well, like those. And then, and then I'll design and build my own, build my own frames and have some fun. He's with got them. a couple of cool board track looking bikes that he, yeah, those, that he, those made, I he made did the myself. frames for. They're pretty badass looking because it's different, definitely different. That's so cool. I, I've got a board track bike, but it was made out of a Schwinn Cruiser SS that was made like 15 years ago. A buddy of mine uh, chopped the frame and extended it 11 inches, flipped the bars over, and it looks like a cool board tracker. That's fun. Uh-huh. Yep. Yeah. Very cool. It's so, cool. A lot of those old bike manufacturers also became, eventually became motorcycle manufacturers. Like Pope, well, Pope was building bikes or motorcycles. Yes. <clears throat> well, at yeah. the turn of the century, there were over 5,000 registered bike manufacturers in America. And oh, my gosh. Then in 1903, of course, you know, that's when Ford started doing mass production and Harley started. And, and uh, most of those bike you know, manufacturers became vendors for larger manufacturers like Ford and Chevrolet and Harley Davidson, Indian, you know, they, oh, they all started making parts for them. Mm-hmm. So that's cool. 
Because yeah, yeah. at the turn of the century, the bicycle was modern transportation. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of people don't realize the Wright brothers were bicycle mechanics. Exactly. Yeah, they made bikes before they made the airplane. Yep. Yeah. At, now, uh, are, are their bikes, were, are, are, can anybody ever find any of their original bikes? Were they ever around? At the Smithsonian Museum, they have their original airplane at the Smithsonian, mm-hmm. and mm-hmm. they have an original Wright Brothers bicycle sitting wow. next to it. I think it's got to be priceless. It's very cool. Yeah. Wow. Yeah, yeah I would love to find it's, one of those. There's the word. It's mm-hmm. priceless. Those were some yep. smart dudes, right. man. Yep. They were some smart guys. Very cool. Well, and you've learned, you've uh, lent your design hand to some more recent recreations uh, of some older cruiser style bikes too, haven't you? Yeah, actually, uh, I originally back in uh, '99, I started working with Felt and Nerve, and we redesigned the cruiser with the tank on it type oh. bike, and then Felt and Nerve ended up getting into a battle where they were suing each other. They split. And they both claimed that they owned that bike. That bike ended up getting stuck in a legal battle, both of <laughs> them trying to own it. Meanwhile, they both redesigned something that was similar to it and started selling that and uh, were very successful with both of those while mine was stuck in a legal battle and ended up, uh, <laughs> you know, kind of going nowhere. <laughs> oh, my God. It was a shame. But both of them ended up because originally when I designed it, I did it on a royalty basis. So I was going to get paid for every bike that sold. But it got so stuck in the legal battle that it wasn't able to sell. They they fought each other for about two and a half years. Meanwhile, they both did their own iteration of it and sold the heck out of them. Wow. So, yeah. Hey, you it's know, unfortunate. Maybe I shouldn't say anything, but you almost wonder if that was part of the plan from the beginning. <laughs> <laughs> it may have been. Wow. So you're you're into bikes as a kid. You're around the whole model car thing. We're were you into cutting up model cars and like kit bashing? Oh yeah, yeah. Awesome. No, I cu- I cut those up, chopped them up, and I would end up taking the body to my dad's shop, painting them, and then reassembling and putting them all together. And you know they didn't last long because I wanted to play with them all and then throw them away. <laughs> <laughs> but I had fun doing it. And then I would say probably at the age of about uh, eleven to twelve is when I really started getting serious with my dad. And every every spare minute I had. I was in the shop built working on the full size cars. So I kind of, I went away from model building at, at about 11, 12 years old. As far as like the design thing went with you, were you interested in design as like a serious pursuit at that point? Or uh, just... Yeah, I was serious about it when I was seven years old and I saw Alex Trembulous. My dad was a phenomenal artist. And at the age of three, I would sit next to my dad and copy whatever he was designing or drawing on the table when he was done he would draw over and over and over again because he was my hero and i wanted to be as good as him and then at the age of seven when i saw alex tremulous it was like you know that's another level that i i was uh, introduced to that i thought wow i want to be able to do that now and i was drawing all the time as a kid and at about the age of 14 is when i started being able to draw as good as my father and he kind of put the pencils down and he would just explain to me what he wanted to do to the cars in the shop and I would design them for him. And then we were building together. At and that age. At, wow. at the age of at the age of eleven, we were building a van for, for our family. And my dad had laid out some graphics on it and then he told me what he wanted to do and I didn't like the idea of what he wanted to do, but he was gonna do it anyway. <laughs> And I remember sitting on a ladder in the shop and I was in tears crying, telling him, don't do it, don't do it. And that was how, you know, moved I was by design. I just, I didn't want to see him do this, these graphics on the van. I liked it the way it was, but he wanted to add this one element that I thought was going to kill it. And to this day, I'd say it killed it. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> that comes up at Thanksgiving dinner every year. <laughs> yeah, do you remember? Shut up, Chief. Yeah. Yeah. But there was another reason that he was doing it. It was uh, metal flake green and black. And the metal flake, when it was on, was a little bit blotchy. And he was adding that graphic, this element of this kind of swoop that was going down the whole side of the van uh, just to get rid of the blotchiness. It worked for that, but it, it wasn't needed on the van. So... So, wow. wow, that's cool. So that's like that, uh, like an early manifestation of like what basically became your style. That you know, that whole 
clean, you know, cleanliness for its own pursuit, for lack of a better word. I mean, that's the way. And my dad, my stuff. dad's that way as well. Uh, both of us feel that if you're going to modify something, modify it to make it more beautiful. Don't modify it just for the sake of modifying it. Mm -hmm. And if you're going to do it, try and do it where I don't want anybody to know that I was there. And my dad said the same thing to me. You want to finish it where it just looks better than it did from factory, but it still looks like it's factory built. Yeah, the way to do it. But I would mm -hmm. argue, though, it only works that way on vans unless you get into it. Every <laughs> van can benefit from, you know, a mural of a half-naked woman riding a polar bear. That's um, how they did it at the factory. Heart, <laughs> a <heart laughs> polar bear. Or a Kiss album yep. cover. Yeah. There we go. But see, now, now we come to the analogy that, uh, that, that we had talked about what Dick Vale had said. This is, we're going to mm -hmm. use a Dick Vale quote here. If you can't make it good, make it gaudy. See, so... <laughs> so <laughs> See, uh, words I live by. I, I, that's 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 my deal right there. Can't that's make my career. Make it gaudy. You can't make it good. Make it gaudy. Okay. Years and years ago, I heard Chip say, um, uh, it, "Just take the ugly out." Yeah. And those are those have those words have stuck with me for you know years and years <laughs> and years. <laughs> that's funny. I was yeah, thinking it was say that it wasn't that it wasn't Chip that said that. It's just one of those internet memes where it's like, uh, somebody <laughs> I think that was it on. To Chip. Uh, was it Days of Thunder or, or not Days of Thunder? What was uh, Ricky Bobby, that movie? Oh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. Talladega Nights. <laughs> Talladega yeah. Nights. But you said always be first. If you're not first, you're last. <laughs> oh, that's it. It's just take the ugly out was something that my dad used to say as well. And uh, the other one was, uh, you know, watch the details and the big things will take care of themselves. Right. And on. Uh, yeah, there's that's a good ton. one. Yeah. Good one. Yeah. Watch the details. I remember one year I was up at Pleasanton and I saw the first car that I've ever seen that you had ever done. And I heard your name and it was your Firebird. And oh, wow. Okay. Yeah. And it had flush mounted glass in it. That's the first time I've ever seen that on a regular car, an older car. And I just thought that was cool. That was Thanks. so slick. I had and never seen it. I had never seen it done on uh, that era of car. We had done a few at my dad's shop with, you know, like a 32. We'd make a bigger windshield and then just put, it was the uh, S10 pickup, that little rubber molding that went around the windshield. Right. Mm -hmm. That's what we were using to glue them in. And I thought it'd be really cool to do it on, that was a 69 Firebird. Yeah. And I put the, uh, the rear door handles from a Honda Civic four-door, an 88. I used the rear door handles because they basically were the same shape as the uh, grill openings. Uh, and I used the rear door handle because it didn't have the key lock in it. And I put remote locks in it, did the blend on the bottom, but uh, just really cleaned the car up. And uh, originally when I got that car, I was going to restore it. And I remember at that time, Paddock was the company that made all the restoration parts for them. Mm -hmm. And when I got their catalog and I looked in there, you could get every single molding, every emblem. I mean, all the pieces to restore that car. And I thought, well, I'm not going to restore it because now anybody can restore it. I'm going to have some fun with it. Paint by so numbers, I uh, right? ended up modifying that one for myself. That was in 19, 1988. I didn't want a pro street car. I wanted it to be more of a – well, Gray Baskerville said that it was the first pro touring car ever built. Cause he, really? He thought I was, was going to say that because I was going to make that comment. Bigger wheels and drop down. Yeah, it, yeah. it's never been – it was verbally said by Gray Baskerville that way. He shot it for Hot Rod Magazine and Carcraft, but uh, but uh, in any other magazines or, or no. historically, nobody's ever brought it back up and mentioned it. It was a great that looking was car. Yeah. yeah, that car is owned by Stuart Reed, who is the head of transportation design for Art Center now. That's really? When I first when I first met you, that I knew the car. You know, yeah. I knew who your dad was, and you know, you were just kind of getting that Art Center thing, and you just got mm -hmm. sort of Boyd's. You were doing that stuff over there. Yeah. And, uh, but I remember the Firebird going. Yeah, the yep. thing was just a cool. It was, a, it was a shame it wasn't any colored picture. It was all black and white stuff of, of memory. Yeah, most of the magazines, it was that real subtle champagne gray, and I blended it down at the bottom. And, yeah, I had yeah, fun it was with a pretty car. I think I built that whole car for uh, $2,400. <laughs> wow. <laughs> Good thing you didn't restore it, huh? <laughs> Recaro, Recaro donated the seats. The interior of that car was perfect. 
all I did was put the seats in and a steering wheel in it. Um, I had let a friend of mine borrow it, and he blew the motor up. It was a it was a 400. It had a four speed in it, but he so blew the friend. motor up, and he gave me two grand to have the motor rebuilt. So I sent the motor out, got that rebuilt, and uh, so it didn't cost me anything to rebuild the motor, and I had twenty four hundred dollars in the car. I had uh, <clears throat> built a Carmen Ghia for my girlfriend and gave it to her, and that was her dad's car. He had bought it brand new, and. His mother passed away about two months after I had built the Carmen Ghia, and he got her Buick Park Avenue. It was a, she had like less than 2,000 miles on it. So he got this brand new car from his mom when she passed away, and he turned to me and he says, you want the Firebird? I'd love to have the Firebird. What do you <laughs> want for it? It's yours. He gave it wow, to me. Wow. wow. So, yeah. I was, let's see, that was uh, 1986 he gave it to me, so I was uh, I was 23 years old at the time. How cool. Well, yeah. it couldn't have gone to more deserving hands, so. Well, thanks. But it Did, was amazing. Uh, he had every receipt in that car from when it was brand new, from when he bought gas or changed the oil, and everything was written down, all the mileage. I mean, absolutely every dime he had ever put in. If he bought a bulb, it was in the glove box. Everything was there. Wow. Yeah. Oh, you wow. couldn't have asked for a cooler inheritance. So did he get to see and enjoy the car after you were done with it? Oh, yes, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, he loved it. <laughs> yeah. That's so cool. But, uh, yeah, it was a fun car. His daughter and I broke up not long after that. So, <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't let her drive I got, I got right? what I wanted. <laughs> Then I drove away from my uh, wedding in that car. <laughs> yeah, that's nice. <laughs> wow. So, speaking of cars, though, I, I don't want to linger on particular cars, but um, I, I was asked, I was asked by uh, the Engel brothers, no less. Uh, they'd asked me to ask you, whatever became of your Thunderbird? I just sold that car about three months ago. Really? I had that car for sixteen years. And I hardly ever drove it, but uh, I, I have a 47 Ford convertible that I, I went into the garage and I was going to take that to a, uh, there's a little cars and coffee thing on Saturday mo or Sunday mornings right near my house. And I got in the 47 and it had a dead battery and I thought, well, I'll take the, I'll take the Thunderbird. So, which we called the Speedbird. And that Love was built that as the pilot, thank you, as the pilot episode of Rides, which was before overhaul. Right on. So I got in that, and I drove down there, and I walked around, and I was getting ready to leave, and I'm walking back to the car, and a guy walks up to me. He says, hey, I've got a 2002 Thunderbird at home. What would you charge me to make it look just like yours? I said, you're better <laughs> off buying this one. I had, if you counted the, the hours and the time in that car and charged our shop rate in 2002 when I built it, I had 261000 in in that build. Oh. I said, you can have it for 50. And with, he didn't even bat an eye. He said, are you going to be here for a few minutes? I want to show it to my wife. I said, yeah. So he called his wife. She came down. She fell in love with it. He says, we'll take it. I said, all right. I said, uh, come to the shop tomorrow. I'll take the shop. I had a few things that I wanted to clean up and pull out of it and uh, get it all ready for him. So he came down the next day with, with the money, and he went home with it. That's awesome. How yeah, cool. It's that a one-of-a-kind like, car. Like three three months ago. Yeah. It was a beautiful car. I loved it. But uh, I need some room in the garage for other other plans. Yeah. So while we're here, let let's just work on it. So what what what's the latest what's the latest personal project? The latest personal project I'm working on a uh, '67 Chevy pickup that uh, you know is a C10. Mm -hmm. And about five years ago, I stumbled onto a real 67 Z28 Camaro motor. And I thought, this would be so cool to put it into a C10 and call it oh. the C28 or, or a Z10. I wasn't sure what I was going to call it yet. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I started looking for a truck, and I finally found one. And, and I'm in the middle of that build right now. It's in the shop. But uh, the amazing thing is I bought the truck, all original Survivor, original paint, everything else. Originally, I was going to leave the original paint and keep it kind of a patinaed truck. But I wanted it to look like GM built a sport truck in 1967 with the Z28 Camaro motor. Gotcha. And I started driving this truck and I blew up the original motor, spun, a, spun a, a main bearing in it. And I pulled the motor out 
and I had the Z28 Camaro motor, but I went ahead and looked at the date that the block was actually uh, manufactured, and it was January 23rd, 1967. Then I walked over and I looked at the Camaro motor, and the date code on that was January 23rd, 1967. Oh, wow. <laughs> totally wow. by accident. Both motors made <laughs> the exact same day. Wow. One motor was built in mold number 19, and the other one was built in mold number 13. So wow. you could, couldn't oh, ask for that. that you, you couldn't plan on that happening. No. <laughs> but every single part on this truck will be original, you know, GM performance parts, except the suspension. I'm putting all Hotchkiss suspension in it. Going to make it really drive nice. But, uh, you know, everything else is original parts. I want it to look like in 1967 you could have bought a sport truck. Just lower it down a little bit. Factory air, everything. When you open the hood, everything is factory parts. It's not going to look like – I don't want it to look like a hot rod. I want it to look like a production car. So what would you run for wheels on something like that? I'm actually running the rally wheels. Okay. Same thing with the – just just like how you would have bought it from from GM if they had built it. Like Even the, uh, the the sticker in the glove box, I'm, I'm actually reproducing that. It's in great shape, but I'm going to reproduce it and stick it back in there with C28 package. Just add yeah. that. Awesome. <laughs> you got to make C28 emblems that look kind of like oh, the I 69, am. Actually, 69 emblem. I am using the C from a GMC uh, logo, I actually, the real badge. I pulled that, and I, the rear panel on a 69 Z28 Camaro is a little bit bigger than the fender badge. So I'm using that C and the slash with the 28, cutting the Z out of it and putting the C into it, putting that on the front fender. So it'll look like a factory produced emblem on the front fenders. Oh, that'll be rad. I'm excited about it. I think it's going to be a fun car. We'll have that uh, at SEMA also. Oh, cool. All I've got left is to uh, paint the cab and uh, some of the other parts. The chassis is all finished. I just got to get the cab painted. I'm doing the uh, orange and black houndstooth interior in it. So it's everything is Camaro related. I haven't decided whether I'm going to put the Camaro dash in it yet or not. That was one of the options. I'm a little leery of putting that in because there's so little room in that cab now. The dash is yeah. flat. If yeah. I put the Camaro dash that is rolled back, it brings that dash pad back, which I think is making it look a little bit too claustrophobic in there. So I may pull the plug on that idea and stick with the stock dash. Well, if you take the tank out and get some factory 67 seats and scoot them all the way to the rear of the cab, it, you may be able to get away with it. I have the factory 67 seats, but uh, I'm going to keep the bench in it. Oh, okay. And, uh, I was deciding which way to go there, but uh, I like the bench in there. I don't think GM would have put bucket seats no. with, with the center console. Even as a, a sport truck, they would have kept it as a bench seat yep. or the one that was in the blazer with the fold-down center section i thought about getting one of those mm-hmm. That'd be but I'm, I'm gonna i'm gonna leave the bench seat and uh just have well, some fun with this thing here's another option you could think of remember camaro had the bench seat in the uh 67 8 and nines yes that might that might be kind of cool but it may be a bit narrow yeah the truck is much wider than the uh camaro yeah. was yeah mm-hmm. yeah i've got to extend the dash i think it's almost uh like six inches if I if I put it in there. I've cut it, looked at where I've got to cut it up and stretch it. Yeah. 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 yeah, yeah, that truck is much wider than a Camaro. I'm almost you thinking know the, that Camaro uh, dash would just be too expected, you know? I mean, I'd yeah. say. Yeah. You know, yeah. it's it's interesting how narrow the Camaro actually is compared to when we built the uh, Imposter, which was that 65 Impala that I, I shortened that car 14 inches, which is only two inches longer than a 69 Camaro. But that car is 10 inches wider than a Camaro. I parked my, I had a black 69 at the time, and I put my 69 right next to the 60, the 65 to see the difference in proportion, because the goal was to make the 65 Impala, which is a big boat cruiser car. I wanted it to look like a muscle car. Right. It was only the front fender and the door are the same length as a Camaro, but the rear quarter when we were done was two inches longer. But when you put them next to each other, even though my black 69 was pretty low, I had the imposter even lower. And when you had those two side by side, if you looked at both of the front ends, it looked like the Camaro wanted to fall, fall over on its side. Because that, <laughs> that, that imposter, which was a 65 Impala, looked so tough being that wide 
10 inches wider is what that car is than a Camaro. I never would have guessed it was that wide. Yeah. I, I mean, it was a big boat. So if you're going to run it yeah. that long, it had to be that wide to look proportionate. It's, it's pretty funny. It, it made it just look like a real tough little bulldog being that short. It really exaggerated how wide that car is. I don't know how you did that car, cutting it into so many pieces. And then when, when it all went back together proportionally, it all worked. Because sometimes oh, when guys yeah. do that, they put it back together. There's one feature on the car they just can't get, and your eyes catch it, and you just can't look away from it. That car just worked. It Thank looks you. like Chevy should have built it that way. That's always the goal. And, yeah. you know, I, I did that in quarter scale first. What I'll do is I'll, I'll take a car, and I'll lay out tape on the side of it. And uh, I'll put white tape down, and then I'll put black tape over it. And every four inches, I'll cut, you know, the black tape out and pull it away. So... I've got four inches of black, four inches of white, and I'll take photos. I'll get about maybe uh, 20 feet away from the car, lay a parallel line, and I take a camera and I set it up so that the height of the camera is at the height of the door. So if you look across, you're, you're level with the two side windows. And I'll go to the very front of the car and I'll take a snapshot right at the front of the car, looking across from fender to fender. Then I'll take a picture right at the front wheel axle line then I'll take a picture at the door cut, the center of the door, the back door cut, the center of the rear wheel, and the back bumper. And then I'll, I'll take those to a Xerox machine, and I'll blow them up so that that white and black line, every one of those is exactly one inch. And then I'll put all of those Xerox copies together, and I measure the car, and I, I make sure that everything is exactly correct. Now I have a side view without any perspective that's exactly one quarter scale. I can duplicate that and make bigger copies on their large format. I'll take the big copies back to the house or back to my studio, and I start cutting those up and reproportioning the car. And when I get it exactly how I want it, I'll put it on the wall. I'll walk out of the room, and I might come back a day or two days later. I'll look at it, and I'll see that one thing that you're talking about that bugs you that didn't work. Yeah. I'll find it, and I start reproportioning it until I get everything out of it that I don't like. Then what I do is I take one of the original copies of the side view of that car that I've pasted together, and I do a line drawing over it that's exactly one quarter scale line drawing of its stock. And I usually use the front axle line as the zero line. And then I'll put the new one, the, the one that I've just cut up and pasted together, I'll set that front wheel right there, and I'll redraw the car. Now, if if I've moved something one inch in that scale, I know it's exactly four inches when it's the full size car. So when I duplicate that and I put all the lines down, I know exactly how much I need to cut out of that car before I cut it. And I can plan where I'm going to cut the car so that it all falls back together and fits instead of trying to make all new parts, try and use the parts that were there existing, figure out, you know, if the fender is getting taller in the center, you're not going to cut it just to move it. You're going to find out that area that's tallest. Take If I moved it seven inches, take three and a half inches from the front and the back of that, that line. Make sure that those two sections are the same shape. When I pull that section out and bring it together, the metal all fits together. Find those two spots that it all fits. <laughs> then start cutting it up and putting it back together. Oh, that's and cool. It takes time to plan it, but that's what I learned from my dad. Plan that's what you're going to do before you actually do it. That's amazing. So, thanks. Measure it 3,000 times and cut once. <laughs> well, well yeah. and another thing about that car, too, is that you used a, a relatively or brand new Corvette. So, you're kind of stuck to track width and wheelbase. And well, so, we it stretched, had to work on that. I went over to DeLillo Chevrolet, which is two blocks from the shop. We bought that car, drove it back here, and started peeling it apart. <laughs> we, 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 never, we never cut a single electrical wire we unbolted and pulled everything apart then we cut the body off of that frame and i made a fixture that we welded the front half of that uh, frame to left the back half loose but made a fixture that slid inside of our table that we built and that was welded to the back half we cut it and we stretched that seven and five eighths inches is what i needed to get the wheelbase to we just okay. slid the back half back, and then we replaced the parts of the frame that were missing. <clears throat> well, so and, did you make another torque tube, or did you make a, a no, we made, drive shaft? We made a new torque tube and then had a carbon fiber drive shaft okay. made inside of it. Okay. So of there course was a, you did. A company out there that, <laughs> that actually built that for us. So I'm going to ask the question that nobody's probably ever asked about this car. 
Uh, do you guys still get letters from the dealership requesting you to bring it back for service? <laughs> no, what I get is, I get, you know, we never use the red, we never use that license or registration. Okay. It's actually registered as the 65 Impala. That oh, car awesome. is. So I get notices from DMV all the time saying, uh, your registration will be revoked because you have not shown proof of insurance for this car. <laughs> and I just, so I don't need it. I bought that as a parts donor. So that's, you're getting airbag recalls on a 65. <laughs> <laughs> the actual dealer used to live across the street from me, uh, Dave DeLillo from DeLillo Chevrolet. And he's actually seen the car. He came to the shop to see it because awesome. I bought, I bought that Corvette from him and I told him what we were doing. He said, well, let me know and I'll come down to the shop. I want to check it out. So he did. What did he say? Oh, he loved it. Yeah. But Too he neat. said, he said he had never had a customer buy a car. <laughs> Two blocks is all we drove it, and we cut it all up. I hope you did a bunch of donuts in front of the shop first. No, I didn't. <laughs> that car had 26 miles on it when we cut oh, it up. Wow. That's, that's, that's just it's actually oh, that's pretty awesome. Cool. We, I can't we even imagine. That's too Put cool. it all back together. Every, every piece of wire, you know, we had to extend a couple where we extended the frame to get to the taillights and all that. But uh, all that wiring just plugged all right back in. It was all factory. Wow. Outstanding. So, so Still has OnStar. <laughs> <laughs> I'm stuck in my Impala. Can you please get me out? <laughs> yeah. <Excuse> me. <laughs> Can you unlock my car, please? <laughs> it would work. We used all of the uh, stock Corvette latches and uh, door handles. Seriously, that's but, just yeah, all the latch stuff. Because I, I yeah. remember we were down here one time and he was showing me all the little pieces on the car. It is quite amazing. Yeah, even the deck lid latch from the rear glass <laughs> with that on. The deck lid. Unreal. So, and th this is what makes you, in my mind, obviously the top of the game. Period. You, oh. you not only are able to design something, but to be able to just not only back engineer but then re-engineer something like that and make it all work as well as you did that that blows my mind i mean well thank you I, there's you're, you're very welcome there's there's no words to describe that what that does in my brain i mean i'm sitting here going you know i, I have to nope. do little stuff like that but nowhere near i mean the, the sheer complexity of what you <clears throat> pulled off with that car is yeah. just unreal you're like the ultimate well, prototype guy. I mean, as far as building something, it's just incredible. Yeah. The hardest part of that car came in the middle of the build. And that was because Don and Elma Voth, who are the owners of that car, they actually took a 65 Impala on their honeymoon. That's the car they drove. Not that exact car, but Don says, I want to build an Impala for my wife. And I said, well, why don't we just take a brand new Corvette and put, put an Impala body on it? So she can drive it and enjoy it. Because if you give a woman a hot rod and she has any problems with it, she's going to hate it and never want to drive it. Yeah, so I said, let's you. just make it a brand new car. If she has a problem, she can pull into a Chevy dealership. They can plug it into their computer. They'll know exactly what needs to be replaced, and she can be on her way. He agreed. So it, we were building it to be his wife's driver. And <laughs> midway through the build, he says, let's go to Riddler with it. Well, this is a brand new Corvette that we just bought at the dealership. The bottom of it is a production car. And the Riddler, you're trying to take a piece of rolling art. And I said to him, I said, I, I did not want to do it. I didn't want to build it to be a Riddler contender. But he fought me on it. He said, no, I want to go to Riddler. All the work was taking that original chassis and using every single stock component, but dressing it and turning everything into a piece of art taking that frame and finishing every bracket, welding it, cleaning it up, making it so that you could put that car in the air and let the judges crawl underneath it and have an absolutely gorgeous piece of art on the stand. And wow. every single part on that car is a factory part that has been redressed. Wow. And that to me, see right there, you, you hit another great point. Don't get me wrong. It, it takes a lot to come up with something out of the blue. And I want to touch on that in a minute, but to be able to take something that exists and out of sheer necessity, knowing that it has to function as a factory part and make it beautiful like that, that's a whole other level of this way. I have to ask really what planet or dimension are you really from? <laughs> <laughs> um, 
<laughs> that was that was the hardest part of that car and that's i mean it, it, it more than doubled the price of the car because all the work is underneath where when you walk up to the car you don't see it and even when you put it up in the air it looks so simple that it doesn't look difficult but that was the most difficult part of the whole build is making everything look like it's supposed to be this way but uh it's also a challenge. I love a challenge, but if I were to build another Riddler car ever, I want to start it that way so that we're building a complete chassis that is a piece of sculpture, is a piece of art. But to take a production car and turn it into that, that's so much work. It you know, starts to take the fun out of it. You know, When you're looking at right. just a cable that's underneath the car, and the cable is an ugly piece, you know, now we got to turn that into a beautiful, you know, now we're, we're looking, how can we reroute it? How can we make it into a sleeve and make it a gorgeous piece that looks like a show car? You know, that's the work. Wow. wow. That was, I got to tell you that. You know, every year... piece of, every piece of suspension, all the, all the A arms grinding and finishing and trying to make the A arms look like, and then painting them and making them look like, you know, one-off pieces, which they are in the end. They're all one-off, but they started as a production part. Man, it's amazing. Getting, getting all of those numbers off of every – every single pair has cast in numbers, and we had to get rid of all that as well. I, when I was down here, we uh, we were both – it was kind of cool. Both sitting on the floor, and I'm laying underneath the car, and he's telling me to look at certain things. He, he just, it was funny because obviously he'd been down there in that same spot 9,000 times. <laughs> <laughs> where everything was had going. Hey, look at this and check this out. No, a little more to your left. And like, oh crap, I didn't even see that. You know, so yeah, it was it was kind of really you'd want to drive around town. Well, it's how the, how the frame comes along and then it turns and goes in for the front suspension. But then you've got a fender that's hanging out here. And how do you have that fender bolt to that frame and not look like you just got this ugly bracket coming over here to hold it? So you end up reshaping the frame and bringing it over and then pocketing a part of the frames it sits right into that pocket and then the body panel is flush from the bottom of the fender to the bottom of the frame and it's just a beautiful cut line that is planned so the cut line isn't zigzagging from a fender to a rocker it's one single line you have to address every single piece so that you don't have a bunch of different individual pieces that are all beautiful it needs to look like it was designed and built this way how many hours did you have in there more than any other car we've built. <laughs> do, you, wow. I mean, do you know? Did you keep track? Um, I think it's around 22,000 hours in that car. Wow. You know, it's, it's a good thing you only charge 10 bucks an hour. <laughs> <laughs> Thank goodness. Nobody yeah. could have afforded it. You know. I mean, the, the year that that car won, the highlight for me personally, it, and it's this is a stupid thing. I feel like a little kid telling you this. You know, so be it. I The year that that car went into the grade eight. I had a car that I had worked on. I had a green dart. And oh yeah. When the those... love that car. Thank you. Uh, and, and I, I have to tell you something. What, and sorry to interrupt, but I'm going to tell you when I go to a show and I'm competing, I hate competing at shows. I look around and I find a car that I think, okay, that's a car that's going to beat us. And I convince myself that we've lost and the weekend can only get better if we, if we win. But I convinced myself that we've lost. And it was that car that I convinced myself would, was going to beat us. Whoa, okay. Well, there you go, Brian. <laughs> That's wow, so messed Brian. up because I uh, saw... That was, a, that was a beautiful car, by the way. That was a that was a fun car. And, I mean, really talented crew on that thing. You, you couldn't beat where, you know, that car came together. But, man, I it was so funny because I had started putting the pieces together on, you know the 65 and I was going, Oh my God. I was like, everything you did to that car. I was like, okay, that's the main competition. And I think we lost. <laughs> and I so felt we were thinking so, the same of each other. I felt so bad because, uh, when Will had sent me a thing that says, Hey, uh, you know, grade eight. And I said, awesome. Saw that. And I didn't have the heart to say, I think I know it's going to win. Oh, well, but when you. he sent me a text and he says, Hey, chip, you know, chips car. I, and I, I just sent back said. I knew from day one. <laughs> <It> was... <laughs> I laid underneath your car for about an hour with those guys and checked 
picked out everything. And I love the way you reproportioned the top and all the all the pieces and the the headlights and the taillights and the grill. You did some amazing design work on that car. Well, thank you. And, I uh, wow. but he, he Brian just, just recorded that and he's going to make yeah. that his ringtone. <laughs> Yeah, I'm literally, I'm going to sit here. There's going to be some Brian time tonight with that part of the show. <laughs> yeah. Here's the way I always say that the, the Riddler, uh, the winner is is found. The judges get underneath there and they look for the worst two-inch square of the whole car. And they find the worst two-inch square on every one of the grade eight cars. And the car with the best, worst two-inch square wins. <laughs> <laughs> two inch square. The best worst two inch square. Best. And when I got underneath your green car and I saw the welds on the exhaust, that that's what I knew was the downfall on the car. Everything else was absolutely stunning on that car. But they left the welds. Yeah, I, I um, yeah, we'll we'll save that for another time off the exhaust. <laughs> so I, because when when before the show, you know, when you're standing outside, I don't get to see any of that. You're just looking from the outside. After this show, when we're doing their teardown, that's when I went over and, and uh, talked to those guys, and I wanted to look underneath that car, and I got to look underneath it. And it, you know, it's it's not a bad thing. Right. It's just that the welds weren't dressed, and the judges would look at that. So, and that like, that's well, the scary they'd part. They finished about... the welds. I just thought if they'd have finished the welds, they'd have beat me. <laughs> it was that close. It was. Well, it's it like a Persian car. rug, you know. <laughs> I always wonder if there yeah. is a Persian rug out there where somebody got disgruntled that day at the factory <laughs> and like made yeah. the eyes crossed on one of the figures in there. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, and by the way, you know that that's where all van murals come from, right? <laughs> Persian, <laughs> Persian rugs. Persian, Persian rugs, rugs and tapestries. Yeah, that's the that's the title of my next book. <laughs> Persian rugs, tapestries, and custom vans. There we um, go. I don't know what any of that means. <laughs> um, man. So, okay, let me ask you this then. Uh, as far as like design sensibility, when you get into something, okay, like okay, the imposter, that's one whole different aspect of things. If you do another car where you're designing from scratch, you really don't seem to work in any kind of a bubble design wise you really seem to just the, the world literally is your oyster you're out there kind of looking at everything i mean do you like my brain works in a way that i look at any kind of car like earlier you mentioned a mira so i might look at a lamborghini mira and say oh I, i've got to do something with the trim on this next car that is just super lightweight looking and all of a right. sudden in my head i'm designing an entire car just around the idea that a piece of trim has to be super lightweight. Right. Like where in, in, in the chip foos mindset, how, how does design start for you? Where does it manifest? For me, I, I think of everything as I want to do good design and I want to do timeless design. And I think if, you know, if I'm starting from scratch, I will come up with a car and it might be, you know, whatever the th I want every single piece of that car to have that theme in it. And if you're in the sh shop and you see a part on a bench in the shop and you think, wow, that's got a really neat shape to it. But then you see another part to the car in another part, part of the shop. You'd say, oh, that part looks like that part. One might be a bracket to hold a headlight on. The other one might be a hinge for the deck lid. But there's something about those two parts that make it look like the same designer did them. And that's the way I think about a car as far as all the parts have to be that way if you're designing from scratch and designing something to compete for a Riddler type, you know, uh, show or, or the award. But what I want to do when I'm designing a car is design something that, that is good design. And what I mean by that is 10 years from now, I still want it to be good design. I don't want to do anything that's trendy. If it's trendy, I want to go 180 degrees from it and go the other way. Anything that I see that's happening out, I don't want to do anything like it. I want to do something completely different so that it's not trendy. And my goal is, you know, these customers are going to spend a whole lot of money building these cars. And the worst thing that I could ever do to that customer is finish a car for him, give it to him, and four or five years later, he's thinking, you know, I'm going to call up Chip. He calls me up and he says, hey, let's up. I didn't do my job. If I made it a 
beautiful car. 15, 20 years from now, it's still a beautiful car. Everything works. It's not trendy. It's not, you know, I don't want a customer to look at a car and think, you know, five years after we built it, oh, yeah, those wheels were popular five years ago, but they're not now. I want to design a wheel for that car that fits that car. may never go on another car, but it is built and designed for that car, and everything works. It's That's what I call good design. If it's trendy design, you're planning on redoing that car one day. Beautifully said. That's that's awesome, and, and I give you a lot of credit too because you reached that that weird kind of tipping point in your career where you literally, if you said, "Guess what, guys? Hold my beer. Watch what I'm going to do," <laughs> and you went out and you grabbed a bunch of like pillow back, you know, Delta eighty eight Brome, you know, pillow back <laughs> seats and started putting them in cars just to see who followed. <laughs> The following year, there'd be 20,000 cars at the NSRA Nats that all had pillow back, you know, General Motors brome seats in them. I yeah. built a car that we put pillows in the back seat. <laughs> <laughs> when you said that, I thought of it. It was uh, Tim McGraw and Faith Hill. He had a 71 Olds Cutlass uh, uh, convertible. And uh, we ended up building, we put a Z06 Corvette motor and, and some drivetrain and uh, all suspension and had some fun with the car, but... When I got the car and I met with him, he says, uh, can we save that back seat material? I said, well, why would you want to do that? And he says, well, I dated Faith in this car. <laughs> and so when we finished the car and I did all new interior, I saved the material off the back seat. And uh, I had the uh, post sew up two heart pillows and put those in the back seat when we sent the car back to him. That's <laughs> <laughs> Dry cleaned first, I hope. <laughs> oh, of course. Uh, no, really? Scotch yeah. guarded. You know me. <laughs> Dude, was it like, well, come on, Naga hide? I don't know. Naga hide might be, never mind. Ugh. No, it was cloth. I will tell you, Ooh. it was cloth. When it was done, it was all leather, but it had cloth uh, heart seats or, or heart pillows in the back seat. <laughs> That's Bunk? funny. Yeah, he thought, he thought that was better. Much better. Funny. I was thinking a vinyl pillow was going to be kind of weird yeah no it was no it was a, <laughs> it was a gm factory uh cloth that was on those seats nice oh funny left the pleats in it just uh made them into heart shapes way cool see i i i, I like the way you think well then yeah I'm, I'm sitting here telling the master i like it's, the way you think that's the hit that's the history of the car you can't you can't get rid of the history no <laughs> you you just have some fun with it with a little sense of humor. That's too funny. <laughs> you gotta have a sense of humor. That's just mm-hmm. the way it is. Oh, oh, I was gonna say, you know, this is totally shifting gears away from you know what we've been talking <laughs> about. But I know that you're involved in progeria research, um, and uh, I just I kind of wanted to touch on that if you would. Uh, well. Progeria Research Foundation is a group in Boston, and uh, it was actually started by uh, it was a, a kid named Scott, or, or I'm sorry, Sam, uh, was born with progeria. And neither one of his parents, which happened to both be doctors, knew what progeria was. And when they found out that, that uh, Sam had progeria and that nothing was being done about it, they started the foundation in hopes to save Sam. Now, Sam, unfortunately, passed away about three years ago at the age of, uh, I think he was just about to turn 18. But I had a sister named Amy who passed away in 1985 at the age of 16 with progeria. And when I heard about progeria, I thought, yeah, you know, I'd I'd like to be involved. So we do a big car show every year in uh, Brazelton, Georgia with year one. And uh, we end up doing a poker tournament cost a thousand dollars to get into the poker tournament we usually have about a hundred people in the poker tournament and uh the winner gets a we usually have a gm crate motor that goes to the winner uh we'll have a mac toolbox we'll have a bunch of tools uh foos wheels other parts but uh yeah we end up we we will generate about a hundred grand just off the poker tournament and usually about another 20 to 30 grand the next day at a big car show and uh, it's a great weekend. We have a lot of fun, but that's how I get involved with Progeria. Just once a year, I put on that car show, and uh, 
we usually uh, meet a few kids with progeria. They show up at the event, and uh, we just have a great weekend. That's cool. Now, well, for and, anybody and, who's not aware, progeria is, is it genetic? Is it? It's, what? it's what it is, is rapid aging. So uh, most of the kids, you know, uh, my mom knew that something was different about Amy because babies are normally really soft. And when Amy was born, she already had uh, almost like uh, muscles. She was firm. And uh, this is because the growth is uh, sped up. And uh, you go through all of your stages. So at the age of three, you're full grown. And Amy, at the age of 16, was three feet, two inches tall, and weighed 26 pounds. And, uh, you know, she never got any bigger. But uh, mm -hmm. she had the heart the size of the world. And she had the greatest sense of humor. And everybody that ever met Amy just fell in love with Amy. And we lived in Santa Barbara, California, and there's a lot of celebrities. Amy had some amazing friends. And her best friend was John Stamos. He had met her. No he was a drummer with the Beach Boys. My sister knew one of the Beach Boys, and we got to go to a concert and got to go backstage. John Stamos met Amy and just fell in love with her. Amy used to go to Disneyland with John and all kinds of different things. He took her everywhere. And, uh, you know, I think the world of John because of the way he treated Amy. What I really wanted for Amy, my biggest dream for Amy was for her to, you know, know what true love was. Mm -hmm. She had a lot of friends that loved her. But she really wanted a boyfriend, and she never had that. But I would say that John was probably the closest thing to that for her. <laughs> and uh, I'd do anything in the world for John today. That's so cool. So and so and progeria typically the it's mid to late teens is about as long as anybody lives with that. Is that yes, yes. Have they identified what it is that causes it? Yes, or? they've actually done quite a bit. They've, they've got a drug. I, I don't know the name of the drug, but uh, it's actually causing the kids to uh, grow and gain weight and uh, prolonging their lives a bit. Uh, I don't know where they're at with current stuff. I, I'll, I'll probably talk to them. Uh, September is the show. It's the third weekend of September in Brasden, Georgia, year one. But mm -hmm. uh, that's when I'll see everybody from Progeria Research Foundation and get caught up. But I remember when, when Sam was with us, uh, when they were doing the clinical trials and trying this drug out, I had seen Sam the year before, and then I had seen him after a year of clinical trials. And I thought, he looks bigger to me. And I asked his dad, I said, how much has Sam grown? And when they're in the middle of clinical trials, they can't give, they can't talk about any of, you know, thing that happened. So he couldn't tell me. He says, I can't give you any information on it. And I turned to Sam and I said, hey, Sam, do you have any new clothes? And he says, I have all new clothes. So I knew then that yeah, he's growing. <laughs> nice. I, I like that. <laughs> and, uh, nice. It was pretty fun. But uh, yeah, and if you ever meet one of these kids, it's, it's a phenomenal experience. And hey, I know that... Anybody, I'm sorry, go ahead. I was going to say that just sharing my sister Amy's life was probably one of my biggest life lessons. And, you know, a lot of people will take advantage of their bodies and just, I beat mine up by working a lot. Yeah. But, you know, I've never done any drugs or, or been a big drinker. And I just didn't want to take advantage and do something to my body. Uh, another lesson that I had was when I was 10 years old, one of my cousins had eight of his friends over, at, or he was with eight of his friends at a party. And one of his friends had gotten some cocaine from his brother and brought it to this party. And all nine of them did the cocaine. And the cocaine was laced with strychnine and ended up killing all nine kids. Oh, wow. And wow. So I remember at the age of 10 thinking, wow, you know, you don't know what you're getting out there. And I have never tried drugs and didn't want to drink. The reason I didn't want to drink was because Growing up with my dad in the body shop, Monday mornings we'd come into the shop and there'd be wrecked cars out front. And I would hear the stories that, oh, this was a drunk driver that wrecked his, wrecked his Corvette. And I remember this one Corvette that came into the shop had caught on fire. And I'm looking in the car and my dad says, my dad's standing next to me. And he says, what do you see in that driver's seat? And you could see where the driver's ribs were in the plastic, the vinyl. 
had melted around the guy's ribs. And when they pulled him out of the car, it left the ribs, the shape of his ribs. He had burned in the car. And he had left uh, a bar up the street, was drunk, left the bar. He was racing down the street, lost control, and hit a telephone pole, and the car caught fire. And I remember at 10 years old, you know, this image in my head. And then when I got my 56 pickup, I bought my truck from my dad when I was 14. And I put every dime I had in every spare minute, building it to be a show truck. So I had a complete show truck when I was 16 years old. And I thought, I'm never going to drink and drive because I don't want to wreck my truck. Because I, <laughs> I associated drinking with wrecking a car. And I didn't yeah. want to do that because this was my life savings I had in that truck. I spent 11 months just painting it. And uh, I didn't want to damage it. So I didn't drink and I didn't do drugs because I knew at the age of 10 when I lost my cousin that, you know, if you do drugs, you're taking, you're, you're risking your life and uh, didn't want to do it. So having Amy and knowing those two things, you know, Amy couldn't be normal. I was lucky to be normal. I didn't want to, you know, destroy that normalness. I guess the mind didn't matter. That's not normal. <laughs> but, but I had a working body, and I was what we perceived to be normal. I was luck. I was one of the lucky ones. And thank, thank you for sharing that. That's, man, that that that's an awesome perspective to have. I mean, I, I, I'm sorry I took it way off topic, but I just I <laughs> no. was kind of going through some notes and stuff. I I knew that you you know were involved with that, and so I wanted to see you know, what was close to your heart. So thank you. Well, I knew that my parents were really busy with Amy and, and, you know, there was a burden of, you know, what's going to happen. Is Amy going to die? And and that fear, and I didn't want to be another burden to my parents. So I just wanted to be a good kid and I loved cars. So I went that direction. How neat. Very good. Jeez. I, you know, it's funny. I share kind of a similar thing with you. I mean, at, at 14, I bought my first car. I bought a 69 cool. Chevelle. And I was yeah. fortunate to have two real motorhead parents who got it. You know, I mean, we didn't, you know, go out and grab the shell of a car. And my mother wasn't like, what the hell are you going to do with that? My mom was like, oh, the floors are in good shape. So you're going to save a lot of money here. And <laughs> <laughs> it was, yep. you know, so for me, I was in kind of that same boat where, you know, yeah, I went to parties and stuff like that in high school. I mean, but I was never the drinker. Mm -hmm. I was never like the party animal. And plus, you know, I mean, if you've seen pictures of me, you know, I went to all the parties. I got the last girl, but I was there, you know. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. But I never wanted to put that car at risk. Right. To me, it was far yeah. more important that that car made it home and was in one piece than it was to go and fool around and, and race people and screw around like that. So that was your first car? That was my first, yeah. I, and, That's uh, awesome. I sold that car, and uh, the proceeds from that made the down payment on my first house. Very cool. Fun now, times, first, you know? My first car was that 56 pickup, but I had another car that my dad had promised to me before that, which I was so excited about. It was a 1931 coupe, uh, full fendered. It was chopped three inches. It had a chrome firewall, and it had a chrome nine-inch Ford rear end in it. It was a customer that had brought it to my dad's shop, wanted my dad to chop it and get it just in primer. So the front axle was chromed. Everything was done. My dad got it chopped, got it in primer. And this guy was a pilot. The guy never called, never called. The car sat at the shop for 12 years. Oh, and when it was getting closer and closer for me to, uh, to start driving, my dad kept saying, well, you can have the coupe. We'll finish that for you. So I was planning on getting the coupe. And I remember when I was 14, my dad came home from work one night, and he says, I sold the coupe today. Uh, that was okay. going to be my car. <laughs> and I remember I said to him, I thought that was going to be mine. He says, ah, you can buy the truck from me. I ended up buying the truck. And I, I paid him $2,000, and he turned around and bought my older sister a car. <laughs> <laughs> so I paid for it. <laughs> but... Uh, I, yeah, I hope you get a lot it, of mileage. It was, uh, I was heartbroken when he sold the car. Here's the greatest thing about it. He sold it to my best friend's dad, and his dad built it for him. Oh. So I ended, up, I ended up riding around it in high school. Wow. <laughs> so, 
Man. He got it. Scott Bruin. He had he had the chop top model A. Now Chip's got to tell a story. He told it. He told me we were working at Disneyland, and because uh, he's 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 kind of the he's kind of the go fast. He's a speed freak. He likes driving fast. That's one of his one of his things. But uh, and since I don't remember the story, but uh, when you had your little when you had your little rabbit, your little GTI, my little GTI, and it, and it had a stopwatch in it. Well, they have a they have a trip computer in that car from okay. the factory. Okay, okay. So explain. So you were going to work, and you were pretty so, much racing yourself. This is pretty much your. So you got to yeah, tell actually, the story. <laughs> if you're familiar with Santa Barbara, there's a road that goes between Santa Barbara and uh, Solving or Buellton that's called San Marcos Pass. It goes over the mountains. It's you know there's a drop off on one side and there's hairpin turns and all kinds of fun stuff. And where I worked was right next to the airport in Santa Barbara. And it was 28 miles to drive through Santa Barbara, get to that road, go over that road, and then uh, through Solvang to get to my parents' house, 28 miles. And I used to work until about two or three in the morning, and then I would make the trip home. And it was always set the trip computer to zero and leave. And you know, it would just go faster and faster and faster, and I'd learn the road better and better. And the best time I ever had was I made the 28 miles in 16 minutes, two, <laughs> two seconds, <laughs> and it was an average of 106 miles an hour. And that was in a 1985 Volkswagen GTI with 15-inch Momo wheels and uh, uh, 195 50 15 tires on it, good years. Oh, oh those were the good old days. Oh, all right, man. It, it, and that car drove like there was a pole in the middle of the car that you could just, with your right foot, you could make that car pitch and, and go wherever you wanted. And when I used to make that drive, I would do it at night. And I used it was a two lane highway. I used both lanes, and I'd be in a four wheel drift going through a corner. And I'd see headlights starting to come around the corner because you're on a mountainside. So you see the headlights before you see the car. Right. And then I would just drift back into my lane. The car would go by <laughs> and then I'd come back into that lane <laughs> in, in a complete drift. <clears throat> and our, my roommate, his name is Mark, Mark Coombe. And I was telling him how fast I was going and, and my times. And he, he said, no way, absolutely no way are you doing that. And so one night, you know, I had moved from my parents' house to his house and I was renting a room from him and I, I had told him this and one night uh, I needed to go up to my parents house and I said hey I got to my parents you want to go with me I'll show you how I do this trip and he goes yeah sure scared the living hell out of him and he said <laughs> he would never ride with me again <laughs> he nice. thought I was absolutely insane and I remember at work one day like I say from work to the house was 28 miles and it's about two o'clock in the afternoon and my boss uh, alan clinet he uh he leans over and he's got he's french and he's got this accent he says hey chip eh? and i said yes he says do you have the drawing you did of the automobile and i said uh actually it's at my house this is when i was living with my parents i had a studio set up there so i would finish artwork at night in my in my studio there i said it's up there uh do you need it and he says uh never mind and i said what do you need it for he says, well, I have a meeting in an hour, and I was going to use it in that meeting. All right. And I said, I can get there and back in an hour. He says, you cannot get to solving there and back in an hour. I said, I'll tell you what. I'll clock out, and I'll clock back in, and if I can do it in less than an hour, you pay me for the hour. Okay. <laughs> 52 minutes. There, there and back. Now, statute of limitations and, has expired, apparently. I clocked out and I showed him the, the time and he says, he looks at me, he says, you're insane and I don't ever want you to do that again. <laughs> <laughs> but it was 52 minutes and I remember I came around one corner and I'm in a drift and there's this long downhill straight and then it goes up on the other side. And about maybe, and this, this whole stretch is about maybe two and a quarter miles and you can see that whole straight you can see and when i came around the first corner i could see a car that's not quite halfway that's in front of me going in the same direction and i see another car coming around the corner that's like two and a half miles up i see him coming around the corner and i'm thinking to myself i don't want to lift i don't want to slow down but i'm going to get to these two cars 
right about the time that they're passing. And I, I and I thought, I'm not lifting. And I kept <laughs> my foot in it. And when I turned to miss the car that it was basically when those two were passing is when I turned to miss the car and turn into the other lane. And I probably missed the first car by about maybe three or four inches <laughs> and the second car by about the same going right between them. And I turned hard because I was, I was probably doing about 130 miles an hour and I turned real hard to get over into the, the oncoming car lane right behind the car that was just, that I was just passing. Right. And when I corrected, I went sideways oh. and I remember going sideways and you know, on a front wheel drive car, when you lift, if you get sideways, it'll do that uh, dog leg. The inside tire will come up. Yep. yep. I had lifted, and it dog legged right as I went, tried to straighten out. And I went way up, and I just put my foot back in the throttle. I thought, I can't lift. And I went sideways for probably a good 30 to 50 yards. And I remember just holding my foot in it and correcting. So I've got, I'm turning to the left as I'm, as I'm sliding. And when that car corrected, it went so fast that it dog legged the other way and I just kept my foot in it. Now on the right <laughs> side is about a 700 foot drop and I don't want to go over the road and I'm going the other way. And then it snapped back and went to the third, third time it dog legged to the left and then it settled back down and I went straight. I never lifted oh. until just when that dog leg happened Man. and I'm thinking to myself, that must have been the coolest sight for that car behind. <laughs> <laughs> and you know, sadly, I'll bet they didn't appreciate it at all. Uh, probably not. But... Well, I'm going to say, how many now? How many years are we talking? Because I wonder if at this point their their rectum has completely like <laughs> loosened <laughs> and relaxed. Where'd my seat go? It, there's only a few times that everything goes into slow motion. That was one of them. And, you know, when you're driving, another time is when I spun out backwards in the rain and I was next to a cliff also. And I just slowly stepped on the brake and was able to stop the car and then go forward without without hitting that cliff. But the coolest time I've ever had in a car was I did uh, Bob Lutz Drive 101 in Las Vegas. And that's the uh, Indy race cars. And I was at Las Vegas Motor Speedway. I was doing about 174 miles an hour. Dude. in one of the turns and the right rear lower rod end snapped off the upright and the Ooh. back of the car immediately goes towards the wall and your initial thought you know what they train you to do is just let go of the wheel and and so you don't you know when it when the right. front tires hit the wall that wheels that that steering yeah. wheel is going to snap right. and it's going to break your wrists but what i did was i turned and tried to correct the car when the, when the rear end goes to the right and you turn to the right. So I turned to the right and I just see the wall coming at me. I thought, and everything went into slow motion. I thought, I don't want to hit the wall. So I turned the other way and I spun the car out. And when I got it backwards, then I corrected to the right and started going to the infield. And the car goes down the track, but then spins back around and goes up back towards the wall. I did it again. I turned to the left, spun the back end around. The car drops down and spins around and does another 180 slowly going back towards the wall. And I did it four times. I spun that car in 180 and got it to the infield while I was in a left-hand turn. With the back end broken over. Yeah. And this guy from, from the uh, Drive 101 school comes out on one of those gators. And he's yelling at me, screaming at me, what are you doing? What are you? And I go, oh, hold on. Something broke back there. And when he got back there and he saw exactly what it was, that A-arm, that lower – control arm is on the actual pavement so i'm just steel on pavement and this car is skidding around and he looks at me he says how'd you keep it off the wall i said everything went into slow motion and i did whatever it took to keep it from the wall <laughs> <laughs> but yeah there's did you, get, did you get your money back no but i have the air i'm actually sitting in the other room they, <laughs> they took it off the car and everybody from the school signed it and gave it back wow so, and then said I could come back anytime I wanted. Uh, but now the school's gone. Yeah, because they want their seat back. <laughs> <laughs> well, here's the other thing is, then, you know, they have me out of the car, and then they're walking me back. And this was on about lap five of the eight that you're supposed to get. 
And we're walking back, and uh, he says, yeah, we're going to all get together in this room. Where I go, well, I'm not done. He says, you want to go back? I said, that's the most fun I've ever had in the car. Yeah, I want to go back. <laughs> I thought I got eight laps. That was lap five. <laughs> so, and then actually, a few more to get back up to speed, too. Yeah. So, and yeah, you that, saved their car. Was, so you said you were blast. kind of the hero. You saved the car. You didn't wreck well, the car. Well, if you wreck it, you're responsible for it, too. Oh, oh wow. So yeah. oh, I didn't wreck it. No. For, it was on video. Did anybody record it? It wasn't on video. Oh, I wish it was. That would be cool to see. Yeah, oh, that'd be amazing. I wish I did have that. So with your driving skill now, let's see, you you saved a uh, you saved a car from the wall. But on the same token, you know, and I'm glad you did this because you deprived the world of having like the Chip Foose Memorial Lookout, you know, someplace. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have wrecked a few of them also. One time with the GTI, I was with my wife, and we're going into a uh, shopping mall, and there was a big delivery semi that was blocking the main road going into the uh, into the mall. So I remember I said to my wife, ah, road race, and I made a right turn, and I hit the throttle, and I went, and I spun around a, a couple parked cars and coming back in. So I was going around the back of the truck, wasn't expecting another car to be coming up that aisle, <laughs> and I came around. And I slammed on the brakes in this car. It was a brand new Toyota. They went and I stopped, but she hit my front bumper that was hanging out and just can opened the, uh, the wheel well on the passenger side of her Toyota. She's <laughs> yelling and screaming at me and, and I stop and, and my wife is yelling and screaming at me. You're an idiot. This and that. <laughs> she wasn't my wife at the time. She's my girlfriend. But uh, I told the lady, you know, at this time, my dad had his shop in town. And we were known as the number one body shop in town. And I told her, I said, I can fix it. I'll, I'll fix it. I gave her the business card for the shop. And I said, if you want me to, she says, no, this is a brand new Toyota. I'm taking it back to Toyota to fix it. Okay, just let me know what I owe you and you know, I'll pay for it. No problem. And uh, about three hours later, she calls me and she says, I took my car to Toyota, but I showed them your business card and they said that you could fix it better than we could. <laughs> so I got the job and I fixed it. <laughs> well, then she wasn't managed anymore. It wasn't no. all good. So No, no, it was fine. I actually gave her my car to drive while I fixed hers. Oh, that's fine. I said, here, I don't want you to be without a car. Go ahead and take it. <laughs> I did that with my sister when, you know, I used to drive that San Marcos Pass, and you know how I told you how I used to drift, and when I'd see headlights, I'd go to the outside and let a car pass and drift back in. I did that a couple times, and that other car happened to be a cop. Oh. Because <laughs> <laughs> you can't see them until they get around the corner. So I would just pull over, and then they would turn around, and I got my tickets. But I lost my license twice. Oh, and gosh. one time, I had a 78 Honda Civic that I was driving when I lost my license once. And I gave it to my sister to drive while I was without a license for six months. And I remember when uh, I called my sister up and I said, hey, I need my car back. I'm getting my license back. So she comes over to my parents' house with my car. And I, I would happen to be out front working on my dad's car as she pulls up. And this thing is making an awful noise, just this grinding, <laughs> horrible noise. And I turn and I see her pull up and I'm like, what the heck is that? And I walk out over there and I look in there and there's about 10 inches of McDonald's and Taco Bell papers in the bottom of the car. <sighs> and just, it's filthy dirty. And she's just shutting it off and then she shuts it off and it does the ka -ka 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 -ka. <laughs> And she hands me the keys and I go, you know what? Just keep it. <laughs> and I hand her the keys back. And it's what she said next that I will never forget to this day. She says, well, if I knew you were going to give it to me, I would have taken better care of it. <laughs> oh. I'm like, really? I'm Memo not to me. Yeah. But I had in, in high school, I had had about 50 different cars because working in my dad's body shop, when a total car would come in, sometimes the car just wasn't worth much, but the damage isn't that bad. And I would buy those cars and then I would customize them and sell them. And that Honda just happened to be one of those cars that I hadn't gotten around to fixing it up, but I was I was just driving it at the time. So I just gave it to my sister. I think I only paid maybe 200 bucks for it. <laughs> so, nice. But it, but it had been wrecked and it was a total because it was probably, Blue Book on that car was probably $600 at the time. Yeah. I miss I miss those days because, uh, like, I mean, I grew up basically in a dealership. 
So for me, my first cars were always like the seventy-five dollar, two hundred and fifty dollar cars because we could yeah, buy cars. Were awesome. We could buy cars for like fifty bucks over what the dealership had into them when they'd come in if they didn't want to put them on the lot. Right. So man, stuff would come in, and especially when I worked, you know, I was just starting out and I was a detail pup. You'd see everything get parked back there. So I'd be running back there with these hold tags all the time. And I was like, yeah, I'm getting that one. I'm going to buy this one. <laughs> <laughs> you bet. And yeah, I had a string of like really just, you know, nondescript, you know, the kind of cars you don't want to talk about. But they were great because I had nothing into them. And you'd drive oh. these cars and somebody's like, what do you want for that car? Because, you know, shit, we'd pull them in sometimes on the weekend and do, you know, goofy crap like cut the coils. You know, mm-hmm. get them a little bit lower, make yep. them look cool. All of a sudden, that little Sunbird you bought for two hundred bucks just became a fifteen hundred dollar car. Exactly. Yep. Isn't that funny? Well, I would. We'd have these customers come in, and they'd be bummed that their car's not totaled because they really don't want to keep it. There's so much damage that they don't they don't want the car back. And maybe it was a '76, uh, you know, Chevy Camaro. That blue book on it was probably maybe if it was perfect. Blue Book was like eighteen hundred dollars at the time, and this is maybe maybe the car is only five six years old, and the damage on it is about eighteen hundred dollars, and or or sixteen hundred dollars, and the car's worth eighteen hundred dollars. So I'd tell the customer, I'll give you two hundred bucks, and I'll sign the uh, the insurance check over to you. And they say, <laughs> oh okay, because they they didn't want the car back, and yeah, I'd be in at two hundred bucks, two weeks worth of work. And I'd sell it for thirty-two hundred dollars because I just made it look cool. <laughs> nice. So, so I did a ton of those in high school and and while I was at City College too. Those so were the best. Those, yeah, I mean, those those were great days. I mean, just My kind mom of bartering about, things too. Like I, I learned how to yeah. barter. You know, I, I'd be like, hey, you guys need a a t-shirt designed or a logo. So you work these deals out with a guy who you know does window tinting, or the wheel guy who'd come through. Ah, I miss those days. Or yeah. the pizza guy, which we discussed a couple weeks ago, which we <laughs> never had. Pizza guy. Pizza guy. Yeah. Yep. I think, yeah. I remember the dream team. You need a pizza guy. My yeah. mom would call oh, me at three yeah. or four in the morning. When are you getting home? Because I had school the next day. Um, <laughs> I'll be home soon. And what it would generally would happen is I would fall asleep in the car while I was working on it. And then at uh, seven o'clock, which is when the painters would get to the shop. They would roll the door open. That would that would wake me up. I'd run to my truck, fly home, take a quick shower, and I'd make it to school by eight. <laughs> yeah. Whatever it took. Yeah. So, I didn't sleep much as a kid. You don't sleep much now. I sleep more now than I ever used to. Overhauling <laughs> really kicked my tail. Oh, especially bet. third season was the worst. We did 29 cars in nine months. Oh. Oh. So that was an average of 24 days a month that we were working. And on overhaul, and when we were doing them in the eight days, I generally, maybe I would take two naps. I would nap when the car was in the paint shop, and sometimes I'd find another nap. But usually just while the car was in the booth and whoever was painting it was painting it, I would catch some sleep. Most of the time it was in... uh, Mitch Lanzini's office while he was in the booth painting the car. But I would do most of those eight days with zero sleep. So there was basically almost 24 days a month that I wasn't sleeping. Oh, my gosh. And and no just, home time? No? No. Meal? Wow. No, I, I basically was living at the shop eight days straight to get those cars done in that time frame. Well, wait a second. It only took an hour. To go to yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I, know. I watched nope. every episode. We did. We filmed the first episode. We had 465 <laughs> hours of film that we oh had edited down. Gosh. Had to edit that down to get basically about 35 minutes of content to fulfill one hour show, because you have all the you know when they come back from a commercial break, you got to do a catch up. So there's about 14 minutes of time that is all rerun. You're seeing this footage several times. So if somebody comes into the middle of the show after a commercial, they can get caught up before they actually start showing new content. So it's interesting how all that editing works for television. And I I do want to say, uh, having to work as an artist during those years, 
Uh, you ruined it for a lot of us. <laughs> um, I'm sorry. No, 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 no. You can I, do that I, sketch in 30 seconds. That's exactly, that's what wrecked it for us. It was like, well, what do you mean it costs this much to do it? Well, I'm going to have this many hours into it. Well, I watch TV and Chip does these in four minutes. And I'm like. <laughs> and talks all the way through and tells us what he's doing. Like, now, maybe. when the insider was there and I would do the rough sketch. <laughs> Those would generally take me about 10 to 15 minutes to do two or three rough sketches. But the mm -hmm. final, I usually spent between 45 minutes and an hour and a half to do the final rendering. Wait, wait, yeah. can, you, can you rephrase that as, and I'd spend about a week to a week and a half on the final rendering. That would be so much better than the edit. <laughs> I was generally 40 minutes to an hour and a half is all I wanted to spend on it because I wanted to get back to the build. Yeah, well, you didn't have time for it at all, so... Oh. Okay, we're oh, going to try that one more a time. Sketch. A week I learned to three weeks. <laughs> do, you know who, <laughs> do you know who Mark Sternberger is? Illustrator? Yes. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, I apprenticed with, with Mark for three and a half years and absolutely loved every minute that I worked with him. And it was so tight. We would spend about 16 to 18 hours on those renderings. Once we had the line drawing done, just doing the rendering. And it was so tight that you have to learn how to draw that tight to be able to loosen up and work fast. And it was all the work that I did with Mark that allows me to be able to sketch as quick as I can. Hmm. Yeah. So are you available for sketches? I mean, if people contact you or you're just so busy doing customer build work that you don't do sketches for people at this point? I Yeah, we actually stopped. You know, we just kept raising the price of what it costs to do a sketch. Then we were, we were quoting people 10 grand to do a sketch, and they were saying, okay. And, <laughs> and I wouldn't 45 be able to minutes get to, to an hour and a half later. So a year <laughs> later, I'm feeling so guilty that I haven't done it that now I'm saying, don't worry about paying me, just take the drawing. And, uh, you know, I didn't want to do that anymore, so we just cut it out that I only do renderings for the show and for the cars that we build here at the shop. And sometimes the birthday gifts. <laughs> <laughs> no, my birthday was last week. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, Carson, Carson's sitting in here, and he's just nodding and he giving got a one. thumbs up. So, yeah, he's, <laughs> he, he obviously knows. And Carson <laughs> is no slouch with a marker either, so don't. No, no Carson's no, very, very talented. Carson is definitely not a slouch. I was talking to him today about that, and I said, man, I said, I was looking over your marker work, and it was funny because, Brad, you and I talked about that, and I – the guy, the guy's way too humble. This is like, man, you have Carson and Chip in the same room right now. Is there, Brad? Is it warmer there? <laughs> <laughs> I'm ruining the whole vibe. I'm sucking the heat out of the room. So yeah, Brad has the same talent. <laughs> yeah, he, he does. Tremendously talented. So yes. I, so let me let me ask you this. I don't want to take too much more of your time because we, man, we've commented the hell out of your evening. But you had mentioned all the hours that you were spending on overhauling, and obviously all the hours that you spent. I mean, hell, if you put twenty-two thousand hours into a car, you're oh. a working fool, man. <laughs> I, all I have to say is, okay, you and I, I share this affliction. So my my big question for anybody else out there who might, you know, of our seven listeners or so, um, as far as being a workaholic like that. At what point do you do you know that it's time to pull the plug? I mean, do you wait for the physical crash, or are you in tune with it now to a point where you just know you have to pull that plug? Um, when it's what you want it to be is when you're done. That's when you pull the plug. But as far as hours, you know, it's funny. When we did the, uh, the Speedbird build that we were talking about earlier, I started that build. Originally, I was supposed to get the car in March, and we are going to build it for the SEMA show, which was the end of October. October 28th is when we had to leave the shop to get to the show, or the show was starting on October 28th. And I didn't get the car until September 12th. Oh, oh, I remember oh, that date. Oh, I remember the date because it was my sister's birthday, Amy, who passed away. She was born on September 12th, and I, I just remember that was the day that the car showed up. And I had six weeks to get it done. Just I was a, almost just under seven weeks, and what I started doing when that car came in is I was working 40 hours straight, and then I'd sleep for eight, and then I'd work 40, and then I'd sleep for eight, and I did six weeks straight of that time 
of just working 40 sleep eight, 40 sleep eights, 40, and the last six days with zero sleep. And I remember in, during the last six days, I had a painter here from, from Europe that was painting a bike here in the shop that needed to get done. And I remember him coming over and asking me a question, and I'm standing there, and I fell asleep standing up, and I woke up falling over. And I caught myself, and I turned to him, and it's Ray Hill. He's a, a tremendous artist and painter. And I remember I stopped, and I grabbed Ray by the shoulders, and I said, look, I said, I can't focus on that project right now. You're going to have to use your best judgment. Treat it as if it were your own and do what you need to do. I can't focus on that. But then I could turn around and go back to the car, and I'm wide awake and focused, and I can continue working on it. And it's the same way if my wife tries to talk to me, I'll fall asleep while she's talking to me <laughs> about something that has nothing to do with the project. But I have ADHD, and I can hyper-focus on one thing, and I'm wide awake until I'm done with it. But put anything else in there, and I'll fall asleep in the middle of it. So. Carson just fell over. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> Trying to avoid the camera. <laughs> but I've been that way. I have been that way all my life. I could, you know, even as a kid, my mom would say, you know, lights out. So she didn't want the lights on in the room. And what I would do is I would throw my blankets over my head and I'd have my sketchbook underneath and a flashlight. I would turn the flashlight on and I would draw all night long until it was time to go to school. I didn't need to sleep because I just focus on my drawings. Now I'd fall asleep in class listening to the teacher talk about, you know, three plus three equals eighteen. I don't think that's right. But. Well, that's a common core. That's correct. Yeah, the way it works. Yeah. Today. Yeah. Yep. <laughs> yeah. But no, I mean, I always hyper focused on what I was interested in, and I can do that today when I'm working on something here in the shop. You know, my attention is on that. I hate to drive home. You know, even when I finish a project. I may have gone three or four days without any sleep and it's time to drive home. I don't have the energy to drive home, but I could go back out and start working. So I'll just go in the office and I've got a couch in there. I'll fall asleep and sleep for a couple hours before I get up and then drive home. But when we finished the Speedbird project, we loaded it in the trailer. I lost 27 pounds on that build. We loaded it in the trailer and I needed to drive home to take a shower to drive to Vegas. And what I did is I, I left the shop here. It was 6 o'clock in the morning, and I would get to a red light. I'd put the truck in park, and I would fall asleep. And when the light turned green, everybody behind me would start honking, and I'd put it back in drive. <laughs> and that's how I got home. And I took a shower, needed to get to Vegas. I had a friend of mine that helped on the build, uh, uh, Tim Fitzpatrick, who's a clay modeler. And his best friend, Donnie, were, were both in the truck following my wife and I, I got on the freeway and when I was in Corona, I fell asleep behind the wheel, woke up about three times within a mile. And I had my cell phone and I called Tim who's driving behind me. And I said, can Donnie drive this truck to Vegas? I'm not going to make it. I'm falling asleep here. And my wife was all ticked off to me at me because I was falling asleep and she wasn't going to drive a truck hauling a trailer. So uh, Donnie said he would drive. He got in the truck, he drove and I fell asleep in the back seat and we got to Vegas on time. But we made it with about five minutes to spare to get that car into the show. Oh, oh. Crazy. But, yeah, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's just hyper-focus on the project that I'm on. I, I, I've always had that where I can do that. But I'm getting older now, and I don't like to do it. I yeah. sleep more now. Like I was telling you earlier, I sleep more now than I ever used to. I'll... I'll fall asleep on the couch just watching, you know, I like to sit on the couch and watch TV with my wife now <laughs> and we'll go in there. And if it's, you know, a show that I have no interest in, but I just want to be there with my wife, <laughs> I'm asleep in five minutes. I feel bad because I went to see a movie and uh, my, my girlfriend at one point, I, I noticed I was dozing off and I thought I was catching myself. I'm thinking I'm being all smooth. We're sitting in the theater, and it's a packed theater. And at one point, it was funny because I looked at it, and I, I thought in my head, I swear I heard myself snoring. <laughs> <laughs> and I, I just, I, I kind of lean over, and I said, hey, um, I said, you, you'd let me know if I was snoring, wouldn't you? And she goes, oh, yeah, of course I'll let you know if you're snoring. And 
we get done with the movie and we're walking out and she's just kind of laughing. And I said, what? She says, I'm just wondering what the lady next to you was thinking. I said, why? She says, your head is leaned back. You're snoring. <laughs> she goes, and I'm poking you trying to wake you up. I think it, yeah, maybe it's time to cut the work hours down just I've, a little I've, bit now and then. I've been there too in the movie theaters like that. Yep. It's the worst. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'm here, but I'm not here. You yes, know, I'm going to watch this. It's about being physically close during this. <laughs> it's funny because yeah. when we were all growing up, we always used to laugh at dad would always fall asleep in front of the TV and we'd all chuckle and laugh, but now we're dad. <laughs> one year one year at SEMA, uh, you know, my wife, I promised her that we would go to dinner. We were going to go to a restaurant and have dinner. And we just had this one event that we had to attend because of one of my sponsors was putting it on. So we were going to go to this event and then go to dinner. And I got to that event and then it became a <laughs> photos and uh, autograph session. And by the time we got out of there, it was after 11 o'clock at night. And my wife says something to me about going to dinner. I said, let's just go to bed. And the next thing I know is I've got a shoe flying at my head. <laughs> like, ah, all right, we're going to dinner. <laughs> Okay, I got I got one last question to ask. This, this is me kind of because uh, it's not everybody's going to know this about you, and it's something again we've talked about. I'm, we talked a lot about a lot of stuff going to Disneyland. That was that was a lot of fun. Yeah. Um, your name, your your first day at kindergarten. Yes. Can we can we talk about your first day in sure. kindergarten before we before we end this thing? And I had talked about Brian. I said I want to talk about his first day at kindergarten. He he learned something about himself. He did not know. And, uh, well, I'll tell you exactly how it went. So let's, 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 I'll just let you tell this. I get to my first day of kindergarten and the teacher calls roll. And at the end of roll call, she says, is there anybody here that I didn't call your name? And I raised my hand. She says, what's your name? And I said, Chipper, because I was named Chipper before I was given my legal name. She says, what's your last name? And I said, Foos. And she says, oh, you're Douglas. And I said, no, I'm not. (laughs) <laughs> and what had happened is I was born in the hospital and we stayed in the hospital for four days. And the minute that I was born, when my mom first saw me, she said that I had these huge puffy cheeks and looked like a chipmunk. And she called me Chipper from the minute she saw me. Well, it was day four that we were leaving the hospital and the nurse came in and said, uh, you haven't put a name in the, in the, on the birth certificate yet. And my dad had a good friend named Douglas and he wrote Douglas, wanted me to be a Douglas. So he wrote Douglas on my birth certificate. When I got home, my mom introduced me to my older sister as Chipper. So the only name I had ever heard was Chipper. <laughs> so when I went to kindergarten and the teacher told me my name was Douglas, I was like, no, I'm not. <laughs> and I got home and I told my mom, I said, the teacher said my name was Douglas. And she says, Oh, yes, it is. Your oh, legal oh, name is Douglas, but you have a nickname, and it's Chipper. <laughs> oh, yeah, that Douglas thing. Yeah. See, this was this was part of the funny thing is when we're, when we're doing the Disney thing is there's four guys in this pickup truck. Only one of us actually had the name that matched his driver's license, and that was Dennis Redcliffe. <laughs> <laughs> because my first name is not Brad. Those who know me know my first name is not Brad. Obviously, Chip's name is not Chip. And then Jeff had changed his last name because he just thought it would be a better pinstriping name. So the guy takes all our driver's license, comes back and goes, okay, we got a problem. <laughs> <laughs> Only one of you actually measures your driver's license. Probably the next he came out and saved us. <laughs> that guy was not happy at all that, you know, he's got this name listed and nobody's off this name that's on the list. It's, just, See, it's not matching the license. We had to go to a different parking lot first and park all of our cars and then get in one car because they would only allow one car to go through security gate. It was, so we were all in the car at the same time. July. That, yeah. that, so I would Stiles. love yep. to go over Jeff the stories Stiles. of that at some point, too, with you guys. Because I know, Brad, we, we've done it with you. But just to talk about it, I mean, that, that's, a, that's a dream team and a half. You guys all together basically working on Cars Land. Holy crap. I mean... It was it was definitely one of my favorite experiences. I I will it, it put that in, fun. in my in my yeah in my my list of things I've done. That was Disney is a great group to work with. Disney and Pixar both Man. had a lot of fun with their projects. 
in uh, in the interest of not yeah, commandeering the guy's entire night, because I would like Chip to get uh, as much, or I'm sorry, Douglas, to get as much sleep as he needs. <laughs> um, <laughs> I'll fall asleep on you when it gets to that point. <laughs> <laughs> How great. You know, the, there, there's a big thing on YouTube with these people who like whisper into the microphone. What is that? A A S M R or whatever that is. Asking could, me to whisper something to you? Get out! <laughs> <laughs> That'd be awesome because Chip could do that, or he, we could just have like, and here is an hour and a half of Chip snoring for your entertainment. <laughs> it's like this, white noise. It's like, what do you listen to to relax? I listen to Chip snoring. Does my this. snoring really sound like a car? <laughs> <laughs> we could market my wife this. Says I, my wife says I snore, and I've never heard me snore, so I think she's full of crap. Oh, I've heard me snore many, many times because it wakes me up. So, yeah. <laughs> when I snore, it's a little tiny, like every once in a while, I go like that, and it'll wake my wife up, and she's ticked. Now, <laughs> when I would tell my wife that she does snore, she would say, I do not snore. So one night, she's snoring away in bed, and I pick up the phone, and I dial the shop knowing that there's an answering machine here at the shop. <laughs> so the answering machine answers, and I just put the phone next to my wife, and you hear, <laughs> so I let, her, I let her do that for about a, a good solid minute and then I grabbed the phone and I said to everybody at the shop that's Lynn snoring and I hung up and I didn't say a word to anybody <laughs> but Lynn is also I've got a receptionist named Lynn and right. Lynn is my wife so when Lynn gets into the office and she's playing all the messages she laughed and she put her over the PA so everybody has to hear it <laughs> and then when my wife gets his office she comes into the shop in the afternoon then they played it for her, and oh, I will never live that oh, one down. Oh, you were in so much trouble. That's awesome, though. But, yep. We won. One for the guys. Yep. <laughs> yeah, but I lost the battle. <laughs> <laughs> well, man, I I can't begin to say thank you enough for your time and and for you know for being here with us. My pleasure. Thank you. Yes, thank you. It was a lot of fun. Thank yeah, you, Chip. Yeah, great time. Keep up the great work and all the design work. Well, the thing, and hey, and hey, you too. Thank you. <laughs> That's why. <laughs> and from the bottom of my heart, though, sincerely, that means everything to me. And um, you know, I I know we probably can't say much about it. We've got some big stuff going together uh, with our whole group for SEMA, and cool. that'll be a fun thing. Really looking forward to that. And, uh, you know, I, I got to tell you, it is just, though, this is, this is definitely, it, this has been an awesome experience for us. I've enjoyed it as well. And uh, is Carson okay after his fall over there? It wasn't his. Carson's uh... ready to fall asleep. He's, he's <laughs> not enough well, over here. <laughs> well, he's, he's already got his slippers on, Yeah, right? he's okay. He saved himself, but he almost took out he's the good. water bottles on the front door. So it was, it was just. <laughs> but on a side note, I have it on film. So I'll, uh, I'll show the highlight reel later. <laughs> yes. on. Oh, nice. <laughs> it's true. You're going to be YouTube famous. <laughs> He's going to do it again, but he's going to shove the camera. The That's top. right, as it goes down. <laughs> Let's do that in slow motion. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Man, it sounds just like your voice. It's perfect. <laughs> wow. Boo. Whatever. So, <laughs> what? <laughs> well, thank you, guys. Thank yes, you. Chip, thank, thank you, you so much. My pleasure. Hopefully. See you at SEMA. Definitely. Yeah. Looking forward to it. You'll definitely see us at SEMA. Cool. All right, guys. Well, hey, by far, it, I don't like using the word, but the, an epic episode 20. Uh, huge thanks to, uh, to Chip Foose for joining us here. Um, man, big thanks to you guys for playing along as always. My yeah. pleasure. We talked about some odd, uh, different subjects that I normally that don't talk about. That was the whole idea. Yeah. Very cool. And thank you thank for you sharing guys. that. That's we we don't want to do the typical show. I never. I mean, don't get me wrong. I want to know what your favorite pasta dish is, and and I'd like to know stuff like well, you know what your favorite colors. But I can me, tell you what it was at Art Center, and I, I'm going to share this little bit of information because I didn't have any money at Art Center, so I bought Top Ramen mm -hmm. and Prego spaghetti sauce. So. I did the top ramen and I put that. So I had the poor man spaghetti is what I lived on at Art Center. And it's fast too. <coughs> Somebody yeah. else who does was, that. And you know what's not half bad either? It's not. Ramen with uh, that morel chili in the can. Oh, yeah, that would be good too. 
That wasn't half yeah. bad. I, I did I did a lot of that, which explains a lot of my physique these days. You know, you don't get a body like this just doesn't happen overnight. This is <laughs> got to work at it. It costs money, man. <laughs> Look at Eric. Eric spent a life. lot of money. <laughs> yeah, it's all in the belly. <laughs> Perfect. But all thank right. you for that. I appreciate you. You know, you you sharing like you did. And man, um, yeah, we're gonna get stuff on the uh, the website. And with you're okay, I'd I'd like to post a link to um, the uh, the car show and. Uh, the cause for progeria i'd like to get oh, great. information Thank you. out there for our people progeria research foundation yep and if anybody's in the uh georgia area Brazelton, georgia third weekend of september at year one we do the car show fantastic outstanding we will make a point to uh to, to definitely put that up on the show notes and uh you know if anybody needs any more information by all means you can hit us you know on the site uh on facebook any place like that and we'll we'll get you the information you need so hey fantastic well thank you thank you you know should should we bug you for one of those cool radio intro things like they do, what do you want me to say like when you do a radio blurb do you ever do those like a morning show where they're like hey welcome to the wacky morning show and you know <laughs> i say that to my wife every morning <laughs> <laughs> she doesn't appreciate it because she was sound asleep and i just woke her <laughs> Uh, the what do you horn. want? That's awesome. You ready? I am set. Hey, I'm Chip Foose, and you're listening to the Round Six podcast. Well, happy editing. Oh, thank <laughs> you. Well, it's going to be good. We're not going to edit anything. We're just going to let this fly. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sure. So. Right. All right, guys. This awesome. is the slowest outro I've ever heard. Yeah. <laughs> Well, I haven't started. I, I think we've been working on this for the about song 20 yet. minutes now. I, I really wanted to ask him about that Pontiac Aztec that he's bringing to see, oh, but I'm, I figured, no, I couldn't. I couldn't. I know it's secret. Come on. Oh, you, you almost have to. It's a, it's a neo. I wanted to do well, one of those you know, in the worst well, way. Well, with your time with Clinet, I knew that you were working on this Pontiac Aztec. It was the Az Caliber, and we were hoping uh, you'd tell us a little bit about that. <laughs> I have drawings. <laughs> it's a dual cowl, right? It's a dual cowl. Though, but I'll have them when I see you. Good or bad. A dual cowl. A dual cowl. 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 <laughs> yep. And it's towing a Yugo. Oh, right. Ooh. <laughs> For when you get to those places that you don't want to take the yeah, dual cowl. Oh, God. Speaking of putting it in park, hey, that's the greatest uh, segue we've had. <laughs> Um, outro. There you go. It gets even better. Well, hey, thank We're you for listening. Shoved it in park. Now turn off the key. <laughs> <laughs> uh, We're just going to end with the end. No, it's thank you very much for listening. Um, again, thanks to our, our, our guest, <laughs> Jim. <laughs> <laughs> thanks again to our guest, and thank you for listening. As always, I'm Brian. I'm still Brad. I'm Alex. I'm Eric. And we'll catch you next time. Thanks again. Thanks again for listening. And be sure to keep up with us gearheads over on our website at www.round6pod.com. And if you'd like to, we invite you to follow along with us over on Facebook, Instagram, and be sure to check out all of our latest videos on YouTube.com. This game, we're done. Yep. See, my You're imagination, right. I was picturing all, all of you guys in some studio somewhere, and Brad's just the roaming reporter. No, I just... <laughs> when I, when I Let's about keep talking picturing that. Like, That's awesome. Keep that, there, keep yeah. that thought. That's how it works. It's, it's, it's an amazing studio. You're in some big studio. studio place. You've probably got big secretaries studio, bringing right. you coffee and right. everything else, and they've got slippers on so you don't hear them walking you go. past you. It's like, it's like watching a sports center or something. All sitting at the really cool desk. Yeah, that's what I was imagining. All, all sitting in Eames chairs. We, we, we only hire mutes. It's pretty awesome. <laughs> awesome. You guys are lucky. Hairless mutes. It's even better because we can't risk any sound. <laughs> Perfect. And then we don't get any hair in our coffee either. And you have a uh, five-star restaurant in the room next to you? Oh, yes. Yeah. Some chef sure. that's cooking things up for you? Yep. I'm going to go to Taco Bell on my way home. <laughs> <laughs>
Unless he's ripped for Taco and Bell. I, and I'll have it finished before I get out of the driveway of Taco Bell. <laughs> <laughs>